welcome to the Non-Diet Yogi Podcast. This is episode 15, Wellness Capitalism, Essential Oil MLMs, Whitewashed Herbalism and Naturopreneurs with Katya Weiss Anderson. Each month, I invite you to dive deep with me to explore and dismantle the world of hashtag big wellness, where spirituality, holistic health, diet culture, white supremacy and toxic female entrepreneurship collide in a dizzying spectacle of celery juice and a bigger collection of doTERRA essential oils than you could ever possibly need. This podcast is for you if you love yoga but don't always love yoga culture, wish to form a deeper connection with your body and the natural world minus the wellness wankery and you're tired of the classism, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, fatphobia and many other threads of white supremacy woven throughout the yoga, wellness, spirituality, industrial complex aka big wellness. I'm your host Casey Conroy, non-diet dietitian, naturopath in training and yoga teacher. So last episode was a solo episode about yoga capitalism and the many ways white supremacy shows up in yoga spaces. In this episode, we continue exploring capitalism in its indiscriminately elderberry syrup guzzling, essential oil doused form, wellness capitalism. Now, if you're already feeling a little bit triggered by my having a go at essential oils twice in the first two minutes of this episode, warning, there's more of that to come. And if you find that inflammatory, then you may want to listen to a different podcast. Or, and this is my hope, you may instead decide to sit with that discomfort Get curious about where it's coming from and lean in to this conversation. Because Katya, the guest I spoke with for this episode, is a fellow holistic health practitioner and by her own definition, not ex-woo. Neither of us are out to tear the holistic wellness world to shreds because we live and work in this world and I personally wouldn't have it any other way. And we're both, I think, just a little bit tired. I can only speak for myself, um, but I get the sense that Katia may feel this way too, (laughs) that we're both tired of the BS that we deal with every day in the sphere of holistic health and the harm that wellness capitalism in particular does. And it does this um, in a number of different ways. It does this through the perpetuation of questionable inaccurate and sometimes downright dangerous health misinformation. It does this through the dismissal of both marginalised and lower socioeconomic status folks who cannot access the exclusive products and services that are often only made available to a privileged few. Wellness capitalism also has this incessant focus on improvement of the self at the expense of communal care and addressing or even looking at systemic determinants of health. And it also does damage to the environment and to marginalised groups of people through cultural appropriation, abusive labour practices and more of that stuff. And as we touch on throughout this episode, wellness is often synonymous with and sometimes a proxy for whiteness. So my guest is Katia Weiss Anderson. She is a holistic wellness practitioner working with multiple modalities, including plant-based food, yoga, herbal medicine, astrology, and postpartum doula care. She is based out of Denver, Colorado in the States. She is the founder and director of Durham Queer Sports and the host of the podcasts Kumbaya Confessional and Queer Wellness. You can find her at katiaweissanderson.com with two S's in Anderson and in Weiss or on Instagram at Katarina Anya. Katia is 
so many things. Um, she is a herbalist, a yoga teacher, a vegan chef, and she's qualified in all these modalities. She's not just throwing this out there with, with no grounding. Um, she's an astrologer, a Kirtan leader, podcaster, a writer, and a really good one at that, and a doula. She is just so talented, and I love that she has fingers in many pies, as I can relate. Um, and as she points out in this episode, being a multi-dextrous kind of practitioner with many tools in one's toolkit is not only a strength, but also kind of a necessity in our current um, capitalist climate. So the last thing before we dive into this episode, if you love the podcast, please subscribe and leave a rating and review on Apple iTunes. To do so is dead easy. From the show page, you just scroll down until you see the rating and review section. It has five little blank stars and you can do that there. For even more love, you can become a Patreon of the podcast for two US dollars a month, which is about nearly three Australian dollars a month and receive the non-diet yogi bonuses in addition to hearing my voice every month. (laughs) So Patreons can access a growing library of goodies, including offers, PDF guidebooks, bonus audios, meditations, herbal giveaways, and guest offerings. I recorded this with a bit of a scratchy throat and I still kind of have that. So apologies for that. Katya and I started our chat with a little light banter about the COVID situation in the um, United States and Australia and I thought I'd just leave it in here because it was a bit of a nice prelude to um, what we ended up talking about and some of you may also find it interesting. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Katya. No, I just have like one like curiosity question. I'm wondering like what the pandemic life is looking for y'all in Australia, given that, you know, here obviously in the U S it's a complete train wreck. Um, yes. just like a lot of things are, but, um, oh <laughs> I'm sure y'all have it much, much better under control. Is that, um, are you guys kind of past? I think generally just because we've got a far less dense population, it's not as much of a train wreck here, depending of course on where we are. So I live in the bush. Mm -hmm. I live in a rural area. Um, Right. Really sparse population. Yeah. Yeah. Um, In this little country area on the, in the hinterland. So it's, it's amazing here. Um, The restrictions according to, you know, when I teach my yoga classes, I'm still allowed to have, you know, one person per two square meters, which is insane. And I think that's wow. too many people. So I don't allow that many people in my class, but it's really lax here in Queensland. Um, in Melbourne, it's different. They're in stage four lockdown because there's been mm-hmm. a second outbreak there. So yeah, really feeling for those folks because a lot of them, yeah, they're stuck in their apartments and stuff. So it really varies just depending on where you are. That's rough. But I'm glad that you're in an area that is a lot more sparse and that allows you to have a little bit more breathing room. Oh, yeah, me too. Very, very lucky. Very lucky. How about you, Katia? How's how's your day-to-day situation right now? Well, honestly, there should be a lot more restrictions than there are. Um, You know, we're definitely still in the thick of it a lot more than... um, a lot more than a lot of people realize. And so, yeah, masks are mandatory and there's a decent amount of mandates, but not quite enough to be on par with, with where we're at. And, you know, Americans are not the brightest. So, <laughs> you know, we're, we're really just not having a good time. Uh, oh my gosh. Yeah. From what I can tell, it's just a big mishmash of, yeah fuckery sorts of things yeah honestly yeah all the people who are like you know making masks into a thing that's like don't wear them because then you're anti-trump and anti-jesus and like just tying all these things that don't make any sense whatsoever and like this is why we can't have nice things oh my god uh yeah i'm really glad that i haven't touched the anti-mask you know depth of craziness to that to that same extent that you guys (laughs) 
Um, we definitely have yeah. anti-maskers here, definitely, depending on, oh, no. especially in the circles that I dabble in in the wellness world, as I'm sure we may talk about. Um, but oh, yeah, yes. as ridiculous as the States. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, I'm so sorry. It would be hard to, no, it would be hard to top the amount of ridiculous in the States, <laughs> like under any, on a, pretty much anything. Oh man. With that, um, Katia, I'm just wondering if you could take a few minutes to tell the listeners a bit about yourself and what brought you to the multiple modalities that you work with. All right. Yeah. Um, my name is Katia Weiss Anderson and I'm a holistic wellness practitioner. I'm based um, in the States in Denver, Colorado, as well as somewhat in Durham, North Carolina. And um, I started out as a vegan chef many years ago, like earlier in my 20s. And I really loved that. But at the same time, the actual wellness or the restaurant industry itself was just a really burnout industry. And my health was suffering severely. I was working like 80 hours a week. At one point, I owned my own business in the food industry. And it just, yeah, I was burning out. And so I started to work as an independent contractor with my vegan cooking. And somewhere along the line, I did my yoga teacher training because yoga kind of saved me from my own demons and really helped me to heal in ways that I hadn't been able to heal before. So not ever having intended to be a yoga teacher, I kind of ended up on that path just because that's where the healing brought me. And then in addition to that, I started working with Kirtan, which is part of the Bhakti Yoga lineage and tradition, which is a form of chanting and meditation through sound that's also really beautifully healing and cathartic. And then somewhere along the line, I added in astrology. I very accidentally got into it after being a complete skeptic for many years. And I just spent years learning about that until I realized like, oh, I can, I can read people's charts and I can, you know, do something with that without ever having intended to like make money off of it. And um, yeah, so I ended up with all of these different modalities of holistic wellness that had just found me in different ways. And I also ended up going to herbalism school. I became an herbalist just a couple years ago. And then I also became a doula. And something that had always made me feel very self-conscious in the past was that I have these different interests and these different modalities that resonate with me. And I always had this mindset that I had to pick one and stick with that and be that thing and do that for the rest of my life. But eventually when I let that fall away, I realized that I have all these different wonderful modalities to work with in the same vein. Like I am a holistic wellness practitioner and that in itself is cohesive with these different tools that I can work with. So with all that, I now have two podcasts, which is very weird to say. Um, And I'm really thrilled with the work that I get to do in the world. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you're doing the work that you are doing. And I think both your podcasts are incredible. Um, Wow. I I just, I just love it when people have many different tools in their tool belt, many different um, fingers and different pies, because it makes me feel better about doing the same thing. (laughs) Um, Right. Yeah. I get that feeling of going, Oh, I should really pick one and I'm not a real practitioner or I'm you know jack of many trades master of none etc if I don't just pick one but I think you're right you what you bring to the table because you have all of those beautiful different modalities is your own unique combination of how um, you work with people and how you bring all those things together in different combinations and I think it's a real gift thank you yeah. Yeah, that's that's how it seems to work out because when you actually go with the you have to pick one thing mentality, mm. it doesn't really work out. I mean, here in the US at least, we're at this stage of like capitalist hellscape that it doesn't work anymore to, you know, pick one thing that you want to do for your life, go to college for it, 
get a job, Mm -hmm. stay in that job for the rest of your life, like that economy is gone. So to have multiple different um, fields to work in is more practical to begin with. And so this lingering capitalistic shame around Mm -hmm. having multiple interests and multiple skill sets just isn't logical when you actually break it down. Oh my gosh. You've just hit the nail on the head. Yep. I I think that's <laughs> so very true. Um, so Katya, given that you are a holistic wellness practitioner and you've got all these wonderful modalities, which I, I can't wait to dive in with you, what I think makes you stand out a lot from the thousands of other health, holistic health practitioners is that you have this healthy skepticism that not all of us have. And I just love that about you. And I'm wondering, where does that come from? Ooh, um, I think a couple places. Um, I am a quadruple Aquarius, first of all. <laughs> I have Aquarius sun rising mercury and that one's a big oh. one in this case oh, and wow. saturn and, <laughs> oh, saturn too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh yeah and i also um i have a lot of jewish ancestry and um as a jewish person like within our culture we are taught to ask questions mm-hmm. and you know not just take things at face value and that is something that always resonated with me culturally and kind of like in my own DNA. And I got in so much trouble for it all throughout grade school and all throughout, you know, my early work life before I was an independent contractor because it doesn't really mesh with like mainstream white waspy American culture, which is Mm -hmm. more like, you know, you take what you're given at face value and you don't question it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think for better and for worse, I've always been someone who values healthy skepticism, sorry, healthy skepticism. Mm-hmm. And I value it in my clients. I value it in, you know, my friends and the people I walk through the world with, because I think it doesn't put us into a negative mindset so much as just allows our critical thinking to stay engaged mm-hmm. and allows our intuition to stay online rather than just being fed and buying into whatever people are trying to sell us. Yeah. Yeah. Bingo. I love it. I'm an Aquarius moon and I've got a few other planets in Aquarius and I'm a a Libra sun. So um, yeah, I get that. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Libra sun, but born. And and I'm going to want to talk about this later, but on the cusp with Scorpio, (laughs) Mm. ask you about that later. But yeah, I get that. The Aquarian sounds very, very strong in you. Yeah, obnoxiously so, like (laughs) full admission, like I am obnoxiously an Aquarius, but, and yeah, again, I've gotten in trouble for it. And, you know, a lot of people have not liked that about me. And it's something that I've tried to like get rid of in myself. But now that I embrace it, I do feel like it's become such a strength in my personal and professional life. And I have no shame about it anymore. (laughs) That is wonderful. Katia, in your podcast and in your writing, which I've been fully checking out in the last few days oh my God. <laughs> and you. loving it, um, you've been writing for quite some time, but in, in your work, you speak about, um, you know, such a wonderful and wide range of topics, you know, ranging from astrology and uh, full moon readings to relationships and sexuality, and of course, um, holistic health topics like herbalism. So just starting very broadly and speaking to, I guess, just a sliver of your skill set right now, what do you believe are the benefits of holistic wellness practices such as herbal medicine or, you know, whole food based cooking that as you are very familiar with, what are the benefits of this stuff to people and why is it, why has it exploded in popularity, especially in light of COVID? Uh, I think There's so many reasons for that. I mean, I think, first of all, there are such beautiful indigenous lineages for these different practices. And these practices, as a result, have really stood the test of time. Like Ayurveda, for example, has been around since at least 4,000 to 5,000 years ago, starting in India. And 
you know, has just brought so much value to wellness for so many years. And the same is true with different herbal lineages. I mean, pretty much every indigenous culture has its own lineage of herbalism. The same is largely too, true with astrology as well. So yeah, first of all, just standing the test of time and bringing so much value and so much wisdom to the human experience. Um, and I think nowadays, especially that we are in so, uh, how do I say this? Nowadays that we're so steeped in capitalism and the health industry as we see it, especially in the United States, um, is so enmeshed in capitalism and that has so many violently negative consequences that an alternative is necessary. Um, not just because what we have in the mainstream is often detrimental, but also because it's often inaccessible. And so people like myself who don't have health insurance, like we literally need alternatives. So, you know, when I'm able to use plants that grow in my backyard to help me um, to avoid a huge medical bill, that's huge. It helps people survive poverty. It helps people survive disability. It helps people access wellness that they wouldn't be able to access otherwise. And that is radical. It's revolutionary. Um, and it's decolonizing because, you know, all of those negative impacts of capitalism are also entrenched in colonization. So it's engaging with these practices can be deeply empowering, especially for marginalized communities. And that's one reason why I so love these different practices. Mm. Oh, such a great answer. I love how you touched on the accessibility of, of many of these practices and um, the practicality of them. And you also touched on the capitalism side of things, which in some ways has taken that accessibility away and commodified these indigenous lineages and now oh, made yeah. them inaccessible to so many of the people who need them and accessible to the people who really don't need them as much. So that's um, such a good point, <laughs> which is just twisted. Um, and I know that you have done some amazing work you know the podcasts of yours I've been listening to are just like yes 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 I'm sitting there the whole time nodding my head frantically um that you've talked about the capitalism of holistic wellness so I'm wondering how would you define capitalism as it pertains to the wellness spheres and what are some of the problems you see with this rise in holistic wellness with that modern backdrop of capitalism Oh, such a great question. Um, I think as it pertains to wellness work, capitalism is when we commodify these wellness practices as products and we exploit them and we engage with them in a profit driven way rather than an actual, you know, people and wellness driven way. And this happens so often without people realizing it because we are indoctrinated in that culture that that culture of capitalism just teaches us that we need to go about these things in certain ways. So it's true, you know, the result of that is that these practices like yoga or, you know, kirtan and so many things are colonized and they're whitewashed and they're weaponized against the cultures that originated them and the people that originated them and they become inaccessible and they become really harmful. So, I think your question leads to a really good point, which is that just engaging with these practices and traditions is not enough. Mm -hmm. We need to be honoring their roots and we need to be listening to the peoples and the cultures that originated them, even to know like when these are practices that we, or at least, you know, speaking for myself as a white person should not be engaging with at all. Mm -hmm. Um, we need to be able to respect that and listen and step back when we need to step back. And that's, you know, some really active work that is ongoing for me for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It is work, isn't it? And it's work that um, um, requires 
this ability to accept and grasp grasp nuance and complexity and it requires patience and not everyone is willing to do that work I suppose yeah I mean and capitalism and the culture of it makes it so hard and I'm sorry not sorry to like be talking about capitalism all the time but it it does come down to so much because Mm -hmm you know, one of the big reasons why we have a hard time accepting nuance and complexity and being engaging with that Mm -hmm. is because capitalism is incompatible with those things. Mm -hmm. You know, nuance and complexity don't sell. They're not gimmicky. They're not marketable. Um, You want to simplify, you want to overgeneralize in order to sell things, including just ideas and ways of being. Mm -hmm. So when we, because of colonization, because of capitalism, because of any number of things, sometimes just because of intellectual laziness and unwillingness to take accountability and doing that work, when we refuse to work with that level of nuance and complexity that is required of us, then we inherently do harm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, exactly. And the ironic thing is, and this is something you've pointed out, Katya, in um, your work, is that as you know, you and I are both holistic health practitioners, wellness um, practitioners, however you want to describe it, that so much of um, the stuff we work with with our clients and the problems that they come to us with are a direct result of capitalism. So, you know, being oh, yeah. exhausted and having um, HBA access dysfunction and, and wacky hormones and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's just, there's so much irony in this work. Um, and I just think that, yeah, you're, you're exactly right when you say that the oversimplification, the overgeneralization of a, a lot of these beautiful traditional systems um, can really harm people, harm ourselves potentially, but harm the people who those traditions belong to and those who should have access to them, but because of these capitalist forces that you're talking about, do not. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of greed at play and it, it makes all the difference because then suddenly, you know, the people who have been using, you know, working with a certain plant like white sage, for example, for thousands of years, or at least hundreds of years, um, are not even able to access that plant anymore because it's over harvested and sold at urban outfitters to white people who don't even know how to, and are not even able to engage with the tradition in which that plant spirit is used oh my gosh yes that is huge and it applies to like well so many different areas in holistic wellness but if we just try to keep to herbal medicine herbal medicine for this instance and yeah there's definitely the whole issue around um smoke cleansing or smudging as Mm. (laughs) i know Mm -hmm. you have some opinions on maybe yeah tell us a little bit more about what's happening um not just with sage but with palo santo and and this whole um mass kind of tendency towards smudging yeah i mean it seems that there are two issues at play there and the one is like i was mentioning with the over harvesting um certain plants are becoming endangered and you know the access to them is being taken away from the people who have had these age old generations old traditions and relationships with those plant spirits because every plant if you're if you're willing to go on this woo level with me every plant does have a spirit and you know that is really fundamental to this kind of work um so there's that issue which is huge it's this stealing and this commodifying and the other side of it is that unless you are from certain indigenous cultures like smudging isn't even a thing that you can do Mm -hmm. um like you can be smoke cleansing for sure but smudging is a very specific spiritual herbalist ritual that is not um transferable to all spiritual contexts Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, to appropriate even the word smudging is something that, you know, I didn't have an opinion about and didn't have thoughts or feelings about, but I kept hearing from so many indigenous people here in the US that, you know, stop saying smudging. That's not what you're doing. You can be smoke cleansing, but like smudging is something else and you have to understand that. So, you know, for me, what I've been able to do is like look into my own lineages and see what kinds of plants both are abundant around me now where I live and also that my people have had different relationships with those plant spirits. Mm -hmm. And when I smoke cleanse, I can then use those herbs. I love that. What herbs do you now use for your smoke cleansing? It depends. Um, Rosemary is a big one. Bay leaves are a big one. Um, I used to use mugwort a lot, but now I'm not sure if that one is, is having some, if there are ethics issues around that one. Um, so I've mostly been doing rosemary and bay leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh gosh. Speaking of mugwort, I love mugwort. Um, I've, Mm, I feel like (laughs) the last, I've spent probably the last couple of years developing my relationship with mugwort and it's connected to my lineage, my Chinese lineage, and it grows Mm. everywhere (laughs) in this, this place where I'm living. Um, and I'm, I'm now growing it in my garden. So I, I love using mugwort for my smoke cleansing. Um, yeah. I just find that that really feels, and it's hard to describe because the other day I did find some Palo Santo that had been, you know, I haven't used it for a while, but it'd been covered with candle wax and I haven't used it for a while. And I tried burning it again. I was just like, this just feels so different to the mugwort that I've developed a relationship with and that I speak to every morning and that I yeah. have, um, you know, roots with in my heritage and that I really honor. So I, I don't think it is um, woo. Well, it is woo, but <laughs> I don't think um, that it's completely non-evidence based to say that certain plants do, as you say, hold magic, more magic for you than others. For sure. Yeah. Oh, mugwort. This mugwort spirit is such a beautiful, like mm. mystical spirit and I love that you mentioned that you cultivate your own I mean any plant that you are growing yourself and are cultivating a a relationship with and even if you're not someone who believes that each plant has a spirit when you're growing a plant you're still cultivating a relationship with it you're Mm. you're growing it you're tending to it so anything like that that you are growing is going to have a stronger magic a stronger relationship with you and I say that as someone who really struggles with growing plants Mm -hmm. I'm a terrible herbalist in that way and I've I've been working on it (laughs) don't worry so am I (laughs) it's just little little bits of learning (laughs) years and years over time lots of mistakes lots of dead plants (laughs) oh yeah there's a couple of those on my windowsill (laughs) (laughs) Oh, okay. So gosh, I love that we just jumped straight into smoke cleansing and all that kind of stuff. And that, you know, talking about developing relationships with plants, that has brought me straight to thinking about essential oils because mm. they are <laughs> here we go. <laughs> they they are just used on mass in our current um wellness climate and when we're talking about you know developing a relationship with the spirit of a plant or even cultivating a plant getting to know what it looks like smells like what kind of um conditions it likes to grow all this stuff generally is completely not taken into consideration um when we're talking about most users of essential oils and especially mlm essential oils Mm. So, (laughs) um, I'm just wondering because the other thing that's making me think of this stuff is because throughout the whole COVID situation, some MLM companies and reps have, uh, before I, um, had my Facebook account hacked and then deleted, but I really noticed, (laughs) yeah, another story, another time. I really noticed, um, before that happened that 
you know, we had um, reps from doTERRA, from Young Living, using social media to really promote the use of essential oils to, you know, in the worst cases, protect yourself from the coronavirus or even occasionally <sighs> yeah. cure, which, you know, obviously ridiculous, oh um, given that there's currently no vaccine for COVID. And, and obviously, or a lot of the time, we have suggestions to consume, to orally ingest essential oils or use them on our skin, even without a carrier oil, even though there are clearly contraindications for all of that stuff. And yeah, like your liver existing. <laughs> your liver. And this has bothered me for a long, long time. Um, this just widespread misinformation regarding not just the essential ingestion of essential oils, but their use in general. So I'm just wondering, Katia, as a herbalist, you work with plant medicine. Um, would you ever consume the essential oil of a plant or recommend this to your clients? No, 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 no. no like ingest, no. Yeah. Um, but in terms of like, would I ever use an essential oil? Mm. Sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many issues on this issue. Oh, oh, where do I start? I, I mean, <laughs> I think the first thing that a lot of people don't realize is that essential oils are herbal medicine. And when we have the people who are, you know, advocating for this piece of herbal medicine be not herbalists, that automatically sets us up for problems down the line, um, especially when, you know, this is the primary or only form of herbal medicine that people are working with. Mm -hmm. And again, the conduits are not herbalists. Like, that's just... That's so dangerous because, yeah, these people who are selling them and advocating for them and, you know, quote unquote, educating people on them are salespeople for a company, usually for an MLM. So an especially predatory kind of company. Mm -hmm. So off the bat, that that just like is a big flashing red flag. Um, and then another huge issue with essential oils is the over harvesting factor. Um, because what people don't realize and what I didn't realize before I went to herb school was that essential oils are the type of herbal medicine that require by far mm. the most amount of raw plant material to produce. Um, so if you want to make an infusion, even a strong infusion, you can just get a couple handfuls, you know, you can pick a couple handfuls of lemon balm from your garden and, you know, put it in some water and let it sit out in the sun but in order to make a, an essential oil out of lemon balm, mm. I forget how many pounds of plant material, how many hundreds of pounds of plant material you need to make just one ounce jar, but it's exorbitant. Mm. Um, so automatically, you don't want to be working with any essential oil from any plant that is not like abundant, that does not grow really profusely because it's such an over-harvesting issue and that automatically brings in this dynamic of exploitation of the plant and the plant spirit. It becomes a sustainability issue and it's just not um, effective or it's not efficient mm. because you can get some really potent medicine with that you know, handful of lemon balm that you oh, rip yeah. up, put in your water and place in the sun you can get oftentimes better medicine from that sun tea, that sun infusion, than you could from an essential oil. And so that brings me to the point of the fact that um, essential oils don't have as many uses as other types of herbal medicine, like teas and tinctures, because they're so strong, they're so concentrated, you take so much plant matter to make one little drop of that essential oil that it's actually too potent for the body to be able to process and this is another thing that i didn't know until i went to herb school because you know i had a doTERRA rep in my life who was a friend of mine and who told me to take these little beadlets of essential oils and just like swallow them in order to not get sick so i did that and now i regret it but um mm -hmm. when i went to herbalism school it made so much sense what my teacher was telling me. She's like, you know, your liver cannot handle 
that potency of plant matter, um, the volatile oils in that concentration become a big problem for your liver because they're not able to be assimilated by the rest of the body. And then the liver has to do so much more work to break them down and move them out of the body. So um, I do believe that there are some appropriate uses for essential oils. A couple herbalists don't agree with that and that's fine. Mm. But I think um, for aromatherapy purposes, like diffusing, totally okay. Putting them in some bath water, just a couple drops with a carrier oil, totally fine. Using them in skincare products with a carrier oil, mm -hmm. because if you're not using a carrier oil, then that's still too much potency being absorbed by the skin and then being transferred to the liver. And um, for cleaning products, I use some for cleaning products myself. Mm -hmm. um, so I certainly don't want to say, you know, essential oils are all bad. Don't ever use them. I do myself use them. And people need to know that the uses for essential oils are a lot more limited. And it's a form of herbal medicine that is very expensive and not very sustainable. And there are just so many more accessible and sustainable options out there to be at the forefront of your medicine cabinet. And essential oils, rather than being that forefront, they should be, you know, an occasional like little side thing rather than your one and only herbal medicine. Oh my gosh. Yes. To everything you just said. Um, yeah. And I just had this thought, Katya, that um, how it's kind of interesting that given we live in such a coming back to this capitalism um, concept that we live in this very capitalist society that the form of herbal medicine that's arguably the most popular right now in the wellness world is essential oil use which as you said is absolutely beautiful and applicable and helpful in so many ways but given the rise of these MLMs um, is is becoming a little bit questionable in some of the ways that these these essential oils are used. But isn't it interesting that with this current cultural background, the most potent and volatile and environmentally degrading and expensive form of herbal medicine that is perhaps possible is the most popular. And all of these more traditional, far more accessible, um, you know, use making them into teas or even learning how to make simple tinctures and extracts and um, just more basic forms of herbal medicine are really unheard of for many people. Yeah, and it's such a, and I hate to always bring it back to this, but it's such a clear result of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, those simple, accessible, um, affordable forms of herbal medicine, they are not nearly as profitable, no. not by a long shot. I mean, you can slap a high price tag on essential oils, not just because they are pricey to produce to begin with, mm -hmm. but also because people don't, people aren't able to um, make them themselves. Most people, I mean, you can, you can get a still mm -hmm. and you can do all that work but it's labor intensive again it's plant intensive mm -hmm. so um people aren't going to be able to access them without buying them through that company mm -hmm. so the company knows that and can slap a higher price tag on it especially in the case of mlms where you have to pay for that mm -hmm. pyramid structure you have to pay for the downline effect which you know these are again very predatory structures of corporations and 99% of people who get involved with MLMs lose money in the long run. So it's just, you know, exploitation kind of at every turn. And I highly recommend for people to engage with plant medicine in ways that are going to be more beneficial to them, to the plants, to, you know, people and the earth. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so much simpler. And it's a win-win for everybody to prioritize other forms of herbal medicine. Totally. I 100% agree. And I think that the misinformation spread by 
I think a lot of these companies obviously has contributed to the to the popularity of this form of herbal medicine. I mean, there's so many people who've told me or asked me like, but essential oils, they contain the essence of the plant, right? Kind of, you know, in other words saying, well, we don't need any other herbal preparations because this is it. This is the spirit oh of the God. plant. This is the essence of the plant, which is flat out wrong. As you said, essential oils do not contain all the concentrated goodness of a plant. Um, I've had friends tell me, like friends in health professions tell me that they just add a few drops of lemon essential oil in their water every day to get their vitamin C. And it's like, babe, no, (laughs) no, you're not getting, you're getting the volatile oil. You're not getting the vitamins, the minerals, the resins, uh, flavonoids, all these other um, constituents of the plant. You are getting one constituent and it may or may not be easily metabolizable by your liver by your body (laughs) so yeah it's just not in any concentration like at any point even a drop in your water like that is not going to serve your liver and it comes back also to this more is better mentality like which is also you know I hate to say it capitalist mentality of you know more is better and that fuels this that's fueled by greed But in reality, that's not always the case with plant medicine. I mean, you know, sometimes higher potency and higher concentrations, like in an infusion or a tincture, can be what you need. Mm -hmm. And other times, like if you're working with flower essences, for example, which is um, a type of spirit medicine and emotional medicine, that is something where you want a higher dilution Mm -hmm. and a lower potency. So it's very case specific. And again, that comes back to this nuance and complexity. It's not always more is better. Mm -hmm. And working with an herbalist who's like trained, like you can, you can figure that out. But um, it's especially mind boggling and sad when it comes to COVID, because obviously this is a global pandemic that has killed many, many people and bad medical advice is so deadly right now. Our livers do not need to be overloaded with more stuff. Like that's, that's the last thing any of us need in terms of setting up a healthy natural defense mechanism. And, you know, whether you're working with Western medicine or not, which I personally am not blatantly against Western medicine. Um, But even if you are, you want to set yourself up for success. And the way to do that is not to terrorize your liver with those Mm -hmm. high, high potent, uh, potency, volatile oils. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. So well said. Yes. Um, I feel like, I don't know whether this is intent. Well, I kind of can guess it's probably intentional by these MLMs um, who share their version of information about this form of herbal medicine but I have noticed I don't know if you have but I've noticed that when you say this stuff you know I'm probably going to get some backlash I'm just releasing this podcast episode when you suggest that essential oils aren't the be all or and end all and end all or suggest that ingesting them isn't always the greatest idea ever some people get so angry and defensive and I guess that's maybe what you're talking about when you're saying bringing nuance and seeing things not just in layers of black and white that is work that requires labor and when people have invested in something um whether that they're now a rep uh, for doTERRA or whatever or they're trying to make money out of that and they've bought a shitload of stock when people have invested in that and you've got someone then saying hey these that there might be some bullshit <laughs> this whole idea of ingesting shitloads of essential oils all the time some people get really angry and i've had some you know some pretty full on backlash <laughs> from mm-hmm. saying this stuff have you have you noticed that or experienced that in any way oh god yeah oh absolutely um and i think that comes down a lot to the fact that with mlms whether essential oil MLMs or diet industry Mm. MLMs, what have you, Mm. there's a lot of cult-like mentality and cult-like indoctrination. That's a huge part of the picture of how MLMs function. 
And I'm not the best person to like lay all that out and explain it. Um, I highly recommend the podcast, The Dream. Um, there's just a lot of really great um, exposés of what MLMs are and how they work and how cult-like they can be, um, or really how cult-like they are, pretty invariably, in order to function. So yeah, when you have that level of indoctrination around a product and a brand or what, what have you, then you create this deep emotional attachment and clinging to it. So if someone challenges that, the defensiveness is so much higher. The stakes feel so much higher because it's this deeper ideology that's being challenged. And oftentimes, it's also your um, financial livelihood that's being challenged. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's such a thing that I run into all the time that people get so defensive about when anytime um, someone questions MLMs in general or their particular MLM, because it's just, you know, that's hearsay, that's blasphemy. Mm -hmm. And it almost hits people or it does hit people on that like religious level. Mm, yeah. Yeah. You're right. When you say that these, yeah, that there's serious cult cult mentality with um, many of these MLMs. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Thank you for recommending the dream. That is such an epic podcast. Um, and I think a theme that's running, you know, throughout what we're talking about today is this idea that just because something is natural doesn't mean it's safe. Um, and then of course there's a the whole capitalist side of things, but this theme seems to run throughout not only, um, the essential oil debacle, but there's many, other contentious issues in the holistic wellness sphere. Um, you, you know, when, when people who do not have proper training and knowledge, um, treatments of any kind can do more harm than good. And you've spoken about some of these other examples of wellness capitalism um, on your podcast. So I'm just wondering if you could touch on how capitalism applies to um, this idea of one size fits all herbalism, mm. um, which is another problem, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I see when herbal medicine is talked about, aside from the essential oil conversation, is that we still do have this um, ignoring of nuance and complexity. We have this oversimplification, this overgeneralization and an under-informedness of the people delivering that content, typically. Because, you know, holistic, spiritual, new agey wellness, it's become such, such like a, a capitalistic influencer kind of game. Mm -hmm. So everyone's trying to pose as a wellness expert on social media. And in order to do so, they want to spit out these facts that seem impressive mm -hmm. about herbal medicine or superfoods or meditation or whatever. And even if they've had some training in the subject at hand, it's often very superficial and ends up doing a lot of harm because it's, it's under-informed. So one example that I've brought up before, but it just, I always think about it is, you know, there's someone that I used to work with and who I know who's actually a naturopathic doctor and like has gotten that degree and in doing so, like did a unit on herbalism in school, but she passes herself off as an herbalist and she isn't. Mm -hmm. And the way that she recommends herbs as an influencer is so overgeneralized and oversimplified that she literally says all the time, like every woman should be drinking red raspberry leaf tea every day. Wow. And while red raspberry leaf tea is, you know, an herbal preparation that is safe for most people and doesn't have a lot of contraindications, it's an astringent herb. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for people of certain constitutions, 
that will be so, so drying to consume every single day. And that's going to create more problems than what you're trying to solve. So either, you know, cutting back and not consuming that every single day or consuming it with a demulcent herb like marshmallow root, even calendula, something like that. Just giving that little piece of extra information and context, which isn't sexy, it doesn't fit into a 140 character tweet, Mm -hmm. but it's necessary because, yeah, capitalism makes us want to think of things as one size fits all because that takes out all the nuance and complexity that keeps things from being as profitable as they would be otherwise. And uh, that's just not safe for human health. Like human health is not a one size fits all situation. And that's why modalities like Ayurveda, which are constitutionally based or traditional Chinese medicine, which is also constitutionally based, that's why these modalities have had success for so many generations is because we're able to see that people are not all the same and you need to address the different wellness choices to the different constitutions of the individuals oh being gosh. looked at. Yeah. Individualization. It's so unsexy, but so necessary and so incongruent with the whole capitalist model. Yeah. As you were saying that, gosh, telling all women to have um, red raspberry leaf tea, that doesn't sound right at all. I'm just thinking like, what if someone has a Vata predominance or what if they're already, yes. you know, really, really dry already and you're going to just desiccate them even more. Um, even when I was when I've, when I've been pregnant, I've, I've been pregnant twice and I have used um, red raspberry leaf during both those pregnancies, but there was absolute subtlety and nuance as to what phases of each of those pregnancies I felt good having that tea. Some, mm-hmm. some you know, the first trimester of my pregnancy with my second baby, I didn't touch it because it just it just did not feel right for whatever reason. Um, Oh, I bet. Yeah. And I know, yeah, it totally makes sense. But to say everyone, you know, all women should be having this like, well, uh, that is exclusionary in so many ways and cancels out nuance in so many ways. What about, you know, what about non-binary people? What about women who are pregnant at this this stage or this stage or what about what about what about this is not taken into consideration right no there's so many things and people who are not taken into consideration including yeah like trans and non-binary people obviously are not who are being referenced by Mm. this person or so many of these people who are like women should do this and consume this and men should do this and consume this they're not talking about trans people they don't care about trans people But that's so important. And in this case, you know, with red raspberry leaf, it is a helpful reproductive tonic herb for all genders and all anatomies. Mm. But that doesn't mean that it is safe and helpful for every person in every circumstances at all times. Um, You know, whether in stages of pregnancy or in different, you know, phases of life and different constitutional Mm -hmm. circumstances, we just need to have more nuance than that. And it also really poses that influencer, whomever you're talking about, as like an authority figure, Mm. because it creates this dependency. It's like, you know, I don't have to look at my constitution. I don't have to listen to my intuition. Mm. I don't have to go talk to someone who actually knows me and my body and is actually, um, you know, looking at my individual constitution. Mm. I just have to, you know, put this person on a pedestal and see them as an authority figure and take everything they say as an edict of truth, um, which is another dynamic of toxicity that we have in the woo sphere for sure, is this dependency that's created when we set people up as authority figures who are not really qualified to be that. Oh my God. Yeah. You've said so much there. Yeah. So, so dangerous to do that. Um, to hand over your <clears throat> your um, your autonomy almost to to go well. I don't need to worry about getting to know myself because this person seems to know me better than I know myself. So I'll just listen to them. And certain right. influences position themselves as that. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I'm so happy that you brought up like checking in with your own body during different stages of 
pregnancy with your children and like really asking yourself, you know, like, do I, does my body want this right now? And when it said no, like listening to that rather than overriding it just because someone on the internet said so. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. There's checking in with your own body, which is huge and so often glossed over. And then there's this other kind of thread that we've touched on a little bit about this environmental consciousness of, of going, well, is this plant available all year round? Um, just as an example. So for instance, um, you've talked about elderberry syrup scale mm. uh, sales skyrocketing with COVID um, and, and oh that this is not a plan to be used pr- long term or preventatively it's not a one size fits all although it's kind of being marketed as that and just a really quick funny story um in early march my family and i were getting ready to to go to southeast asia for a yoga teacher training um yeah just oh. worst timing ever just like the whole covid thing was breaking we just got back um home you know before the shit really hit the fan but the week before we were to leave, I'd started getting the very first signs of a cold and knowing we were about to travel and, you know, not yet fully cognizant, I don't think, of the full <laughs> impact of COVID, I um, I decided I'd gather some elderberries from around the place I live and they were hard to find. Even at that time, I, I had to ask a neighbour if I could come into her yard and harvest, you know, some of her berries. Lucky, Luckily, there were some that were ripe. Um, her tree was yielding a small amount and I made some medicine with those berries. Um, but by the time I came back to Australia and, had, you know, finished our two weeks of quarantine at home, The harvest, I went back to my neighbor's house and the harvest had well finished. There were no more ripe berries. Nature just doesn't produce this stuff indiscriminately. It doesn't produce it in massive quantities year round. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there's not only a disconnect um, with our internal landscapes, with our bodies, but a disconnect in even thinking that these plants are available year round and it's holistic and natural. So everyone, you just go nuts with the elderberry. (laughs) That's such a good point. Yeah. And I do think that, you know, the context in which you used it, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Like at the first onset of illness, like right as you can tell something's, you know, shit's going to hit the fan Mm -hmm. with your health, whether it's a cold or flu, that is a nice time to use elderberry if you don't have any of the major contraindications. Yes. Um, But yeah, to use it, just like constantly be guzzling it preventatively really does not serve the immune system at all because Mm -hmm. it's, it's, mo- it's not bi-direct, uh, it doesn't modulate bi-directionally. So elderberry cranks the immune system up rather than modulating it you know, back down when it's overactive. So if you're constantly taking a substance that is you know, modulating your immune system up, up, up mm-hmm. into hyperdrive, then it's not going to be um, as helpful when you really need it. Um, so yeah, that's why taking it in short term increments just on the, at the onset of illness is what you want because you don't want to constantly be having your immune system at that high resting place. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't serve you. It doesn't help to keep you healthy at all. And it really does the opposite. And there's a little bit more complexity than that, but especially, um, yeah, with something like COVID, it, yeah, it's for the most part not what we want to focus on. There are herbs that modulate the immune system bidirectionally that can help us to adapt to you know what the immune system is dealing with. But of course, we're not talking about any of that. We're just saying, you know, elderberry, good, <laughs> buy it, take it every day. It's good for you. And oh, oh, God. oh that's... That's so sad for, for the plants and for, you know, us as humans, but you know, the corporations that are making products out of it and commodifying it, they're doing great. Mm, Of course fucking capitalism (laughs) oh my gosh oh yeah yeah just even touching on that issue of over harvesting um you know it obviously happens with certain herbs um but 
as a nutritionist, I see the same thing and you might have seen this too happening with harvesting superfoods. You know, it's not just herbs, mm-hmm. there's many so-called superfoods that carry a really heavy environmental and social footprint that people who are, um, you know, health conscious and, you know, feel like they're also environmentally conscious just don't necessarily consider some of these issues um there's just yeah. you know there's a lot quinoa. of yeah quinoa exactly exactly just as one example um yeah it's just once a bolivian farmer's food now in the pantry of every upper middle class health aficionado at a high price right um yeah these, these and i do eat list. quinoa sometimes don't get me wrong yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> me too you know i'm not trying to push push for it to be eaten by myself or others like every day all mm-hmm. the time like yeah, yeah we have to be conscious of that impact that a lot of people aren't wanting to be conscious of yeah because it takes research and work and effort and discernment or, you know viveka it takes this stuff and who has time for that <laughs> right <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And like people like want to care <laughs> to a certain mm-hmm. degree, but mm-hmm. especially if it doesn't benefit them on a selfish personal level, then it's like, well, I don't really want to care anymore. Never mind. Oh. Especially if your ego has already just dis- like made a decision about what's good and what's bad. Oh my um, and this is certainly true in the vegan community. So I've been vegan for almost 10 years now. And I've known so many vegans who say like, well, I'm vegan. So like, I'm a moral person. I don't have to even think about ethics in any other way because I'm vegan and that checks the box. And, you know, everything I eat is cruelty free because I'm vegan. And like, nah, honey, do you know about like the slave labor that was used to produce your vegan coffee or chocolate bar and things like that? And obviously like we're not trying to strive for moral purity because that's not possible here, but we can be conscious of the impacts that our choices have and be willing to look at that even when our egos don't want to when our egos want to say i am good because i am vegan or i am doing this or that but there is more complexity to that oh my gosh yes i have been that vegan (laughs) what was that Mm. um but yeah you're right you know it's it's like well are we are we living a certain lifestyle that um, you know allows us to look like we care about these issues, or is it one that maybe reinforces or prioritizes health and fitness over everything else? Um, right, and that you know um, social and environmental issues are secondary to optimizing our, our health in the most ultimate way. Um, but yeah, it's, there's nuance of course to this as well. And there's no, um, there's no perfection in this just being conscious and maybe thinking about some of these issues is is something that I see maybe a growing number of people doing, but in, in the past, I guess for the most part, not a huge thing. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, thankfully awareness is, spreading through you know all the resources that we have at our fingertips like when I went vegan 10 years ago I didn't think about the environment environmental or um, social impacts or human rights impacts of the chocolate that I was eating but now like you know there's this cool Instagram account called the food empowerment project and they have a whole list where they've done extensive research into which companies use slave labor and which do not Um, and it's so helpful So, you know, there's all sorts of resources like this that make it doable to put in that little bit of work and effort and awareness so that it can then be sustained through our choices as best we can. Mm, Yep. Beautifully said. I'm going to change gears slightly, still sticking with this kind of theme of wellness capitalism because there's just so much to talk about with this but I've I'm wondering what your opinion is on this Katia so I don't know if you've noticed but one new kind of trendy mashup term that it actually makes me cringe really hard is naturopreneur (laughs) have you heard of this have you heard of that word in the states I think actually 
only today, I had an interview with someone else earlier, and I think only today did I hear that word for the first time. And I, I was like, wait, 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 what? <laughs> Twice in one day, lucky you. Um, yeah, well, it's, it's as you probably now um, figured out, it's this combination of naturopath or possibly insert other holistic health practitioner here and entrepreneur. And it just makes me remember that wellness capitalism isn't just this global nebulous force that kind of just sweeps us all helplessly into this gaping abyss. It extends to individual practitioners themselves. And yeah, some of my, some of my most respected teachers and colleagues describe themselves as naturopreneurs and it doesn't, Mm. you know, it doesn't mean they all take a cutthroat business over everything kind of approach to their work or whatever um the market at least in australia is really oversaturated with new graduate naturopaths um many of which Mm -hmm. end up leaving the profession at the school um, i'm undertaking my naturopath degree with at the moment they used to have a western herbal medicine degree but that has been totally ditched now because everyone wants to be a naturopath um oh interesting as it's it's, it encompasses what was covered in that herbalism degree, but it's seen as better for whatever reason. Um, hmm. And the attrition rate is, is also just so high with, with many of these graduate naturopaths. Um, so I, I guess I can see why some business savvy won't hurt and could really help make your business sustainable as a new grad um, naturopath. And, you know, connecting and collaborating with other practitioners is all great, even though the word naturopreneur still creeps me right out. But Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) you, I think you said in in one of your podcasts that there are some naturopaths who take and like, like this person you used to work for by the sounds of it, who take a very reductionist capitalist approach to their work to the point of detriment where they're saying stuff like every woman should take raspberry leaf regularly or whatever. Um, Mm -hmm. And, and for these people, it just really seems to come down to the dollar and maximizing sales. Um, And it can even extend to mentoring other naturopaths on how to, you know, maximize their passive online income. And Oh my God. Cause that's such a thing. Like everyone now is trying to be a, a coach of wellness coaches yeah. and, or like a coach for a naturopath, like a business coach for people who do this work. So yeah, that's yes. a whole thing. Sorry, yeah. I interrupted you though. Oh my gosh. Yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and the, the thing that I've noticed is that, you know, many of these coaches of coaches, even um, the, re- the ones who seem to be really successful and running massive multi-day seminars and courses with hundreds of participants are are those with a really big personality they've got a lot of um charisma or maybe they just look like a fitness model but they when i've spoken to many of my lecturers who maybe taught some of these people um at at college they're not necessarily the most skilled most client-centered most experienced most talented practitioners Mm. um yeah no surprise Yeah, but they've got heaps of drive and um, motivation. And a lot of that comes from reading Tony Robbins books or whatever. Oh, God. Going to his fucking seminars and um oh, Jesus just Christ. This, yeah yeah it's it's scary it's it's actually scary yeah. when we look at the most successful um some of the most successful naturopaths at least from what i can see here in australia a lot of them follow big name motivational you know capitalism <laughs> giants like tony robbins and that is yeah because that content teaches you how to be manipulative in ways that are profitable you just have to sacrifice your ethics in order to do so. And you don't know that's what you're doing because it's told, you're told that it's not what you're doing, but it's yeah. absolutely what you're doing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like when I hear this term naturopreneur, it's, it's funny because like uh, the two root words like naturopath and mm-hmm. entrepreneur, neither of those categories of, of people are inherently bad. Mm. You know, there's nothing inherently wrong with being a naturopath or an entrepreneur. There are great naturopaths and great entrepreneurs. And of course, there are really shitty and manipulative ones as well. 
But yeah, when we talk about business savvy and the role that it plays is that obviously having some business savvy in whatever we're doing is helpful as long as we are engaging it with ethics. Mm -hmm. And we have to have some critical thinking in order to do so. We have to employ some skepticism in order to do so because when we are taught business savvy in ways that involve so much exploitation, manipulation, et cetera, versus authenticity and transparency and integrity, mm-hmm. um, then obviously we're gonna we're gonna be shitty mm-hmm. and unethical entrepreneurs, even if it's making us successful and even if no one is calling us out on it because it's what everyone's doing. But um, yeah, what I noticed is that, you know, these big name naturopreneurs or whatever are oftentimes people who, yeah, not only got in with really effective but shady and manipulative business practices, Mm -hmm. but also are typically people who kind of got in the game early. Mm -hmm. Um, It's almost like how MLMs work in the way Mm -hmm. that in order to be one of the people who makes a lot of money you have to be within the first wave or second wave of people who got in the door Mm -hmm. and started um you know doing the work and trying to build a business and a following with it um you know in mlms like anyone who gets in the door after those first or second waves like forget about it you're gonna lose money um and the same is kind of true here because it's a game of saturation and now that at least, you know, a lot of these markets are really saturated here in the United States, you see people, even with a ton of drive, and even people um, who are engaging in pretty manipulative or exploitative practices, mm. a lot of them still aren't necessarily making money or like getting to that top tier sure. because just because of when they got in the game. Mm. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. And I also, yeah, really appreciate you identifying that parallel again with good old MLM, essential oil, whatever companies and how when profits are prioritized over ethics and over the clients themselves, even some blatantly harmful shit can happen you know whether that's signing up someone who can't afford a hundred dollars of essential oils every month or it's um Mm -hmm. a naturopath pushing you know supplement heavy weight loss or detox protocols onto clients Mm. you know i've been to these um, nutraceutical company seminars and conferences where you'll rock up and you are presented and given with a heap of free samples of course but these weight loss and detox protocols that seem to have and may have a bunch of cherry pick science um there to back them up and you're given the colorful flow charts that make it so easy for the practitioners to in air quotes individualize <laughs> stuff to people mm. by putting them and on the detox industry yeah, yeah let's oh, just- that in itself is such a, a whole other topic <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> but you're right i mean industry. This is a way to increase your profits. If you're getting every client to, you're convincing them that they need to detox and that they need to buy four hundred dollars worth of supplements every two weeks from you or whatever. Um, but yeah, not not exactly ethical. And yeah, oh god, the detox industry and how that um, intersects with holistic wellness and the complete negation or dismissal or ignorance of how many people are affected by eating disorders and disordered eating. Thank you. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. Oh, good Lord. Yeah. And it's, it becomes a game of disease mongering too, Mm. of, Mm -hmm. um, you know, manipulating people and convincing people that if they don't do your detox program, then they definitely have you know major parasites or they definitely have adrenal fatigue and things like that you know these things that are hard to prove that you don't have um and are easy to prove that you do have prove quote unquote like make people believe that they do have 
And that's, I mean, I think I might do an entire episode on disease mongering soon, even though I know I touched on it earlier, but it is a massively popular manipulation tactic these days Mm -hmm. that I think a lot of influencers and entrepreneurs don't even think that they're engaging with, like they don't realize it. Mm -hmm. They truly believe that, you know, what they're telling people is good and important but really it's fear mongering. I mean, you're, you're manipulating people into believing that they have certain ailments Mm -hmm. without often even knowing these people. Um, you know, doing any testing at all. (laughs) Right. Yeah. I know a lot of like holistic fertility brands, Mm -hmm. um, kind of try to convince their audience that they have fertility issues. Um, without doing any testing, anything like that. And it's so easy to have that mentality creep into your mind and so easy to start believing that. And then you have to pull yourself back and be like, wait, why do I think this about my body when I have no indication that this is actually the case? Um, So yeah, we have all these different factors that are determining the success of these different naturopreneurs or whatever. So whether or not they have read a bunch of Tony Robbins books and have gotten good at manipulating people in the same way that Tony Robbins does. Mm -hmm. Um, Tony Robbins is, oh God, he has so many um, sexual assault allegations, by the way. Um, That's a side note, but that guy's a whole whole mess. Um, Or how how early you got in the game or how charismatic you are or how good you are at disease mongering. Mm. But none of these factors have anything to do with you being a good naturopath, a good practitioner. And this is, you know, even true with like astrologers and other wellness practitioners, yoga teachers, you know, what should determine success and popularity is like how good you are Mm. at you're in your field like how much good you bring to the world through your work how qualified how able you are to hold space for the nuance and the depth of information at hand how good you are at being able to tailor it to different people and make it accessible make it empowering Mm -hmm. but that's not at all what's determining success here and that's how you know that there's a problem and that's how you know that we need to be skeptical and thinking about doing things a different way Oh, wow. Amen. Yep. <laughs> oh, on that note, I'm just wondering how, like, Katya, do you have any advice for people who are looking for some guidance or a practitioner even to help them, um, you know, with any health issues they may be having or that they're worried about, any way that they can discern and select someone to help them who's actually going to not do harm who's not going to amplify maybe some pre-existing orthorexia which of course so many of us have um mm, yes. to not amp to not like worsen this this healthism um how how can people know whether and, and i mean i'm kind of wondering myself i don't know what the answer is but do you have any ideas on how people can select someone who's actually going to take the time to individualize stuff to them and to not worsen maybe a pre-existing eating disorder or disordered eating oh that's such a good question <laughs> oh that's just because i want to know the answer too <laughs> yeah i mean i know some practices mm-hmm some, you know, groups of practitioners that have policies around things like, you know, they don't do weigh-ins. They don't, um, you know, they have really explicit policies that keep their practitioners um, accountable for not engaging with any sort of fat phobia or body Mm -hmm. shaming or um, promoting orthorexia and things like that. Um, just thinking about one particular practice back in Durham, North Carolina, where I lived for a while, there's this place called Mosaic Comprehensive Care, which has um, some practitioners who are more Western medicine, I think, and some who are more holistic. But so there are practices out there like that, which I think is wonderful. And then there are practitioners who individually state their, um, their policies like that. And um, so whether 
specifically searching for that or even asking practitioners one-on-one like hey you know what is what are your thoughts on this like how do you as a practitioner um work with not shaming your clients and not um promoting any sort of internalized fat phobia or eating disordered behavior. Um, And you'll know, like, if they get uncomfortable with that or if they get defensive with that, then they're not your practitioner, probably. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that in any case, like, using your intuition is a powerful tool because it will tell you really important information. Like, if your intuition inherently feels uncomfortable with a practitioner, like, you don't have to know why. You can just Mm -hmm. trust that that's not the choice for you. And likewise, like if the practitioner um, really presents the nuance and the depth of complexity and information at hand, if they take the time to really get to know you and to respect you rather than shame you, um, rather than pushing any sort of brand or product or prescriptive approach onto you. But if they really get to take the time to find the nuance and the complexity of who you are and what your needs are and meet that with a nuanced and complex, a nuanced and complex approach that is respectful of you and respectful of any cultures that practices may be drawn from and respect for any plants that you might be working with, et cetera. I think that can help point you in the right direction And the last thing I'll say about it is that, you know, if you start working with someone and it starts going into a direction that you don't feel comfortable with, don't feel bad discontinuing your care and seeking out someone else. Like it's just not worth it Mm -hmm. to be working with someone who's ultimately going to either be harmful to you or just not really be helpful to you. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. So, Katya, we're going to start wrapping things up because I'm conscious of time. Oh, <laughs> and totally. I'm just, I know that um, you probably want to go to bed uh, in the next hour or so, but I'm just going to throw this out there. So this podcast is called The Non-Diet Yogi and almost all the guests I've had so far on this little podcast um, have experiences with disordered eating or eating disorders myself included um either Mm -hmm. personally or in their work with their clients and it it seems to me like personal experience can bring some of us to work in the fields that we're working in um oh yeah i i recently read an article where you outlined a bit of your own journey with disordered eating and i'm just wondering if you would be comfortable to tell us a bit about that and how you think it influences the work you do today, if, if at all. Oh, for sure. Yeah, it does in a huge way. Um, I don't think that I've talked about this on Kumbaya Confessional at all, but, um, yeah, I have a very significant history with eating disorders. Um, I spent pretty much my whole adolescence almost dying from anorexia and, then had a really bad relapse in my early 20s. Um, I've struggled with anorexia nervosa, orthorexia, as well as um, compulsive exercise, which some people categorize as exercise bulimia, some people categorize it as anorexia athletica, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Um, It's had a really big role in my life. And um, when I became a chef, I did that as this really radical act of love Mm -hmm. in, you know, sort of flipping the script on my relationship with food and on my relationship with my own body to be a relationship of love and nurturance for myself and others. And it wasn't just that easy. I mean, I didn't just decide to become a chef and it healed my eating disorders Mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. I had to go to years of therapy, which at times was not financially accessible to me when I needed it. Um, You know, there were definitely times when I needed to go to inpatient therapy and could not access that either. Um, So it certainly wasn't as simple as just becoming a chef and flipping the script on food and body. But um, yeah, with therapy, with yoga, with deep, deep trauma healing work, 
I was able to come so much farther than I ever thought was possible. Like there were so many years when I thought I would never really be able to recover and that it just, this was just going to be my life until I died. And Mm -hmm. I almost came to accept that because it just felt so impossible. But yoga, I will say, um, helped me to recover a lot more easily than I had known possible as well as working with incredible therapists to heal um, PTSD stuff. Mm -hmm. And so now, yeah, like when I engage with food, for an an example, and movement work, for me personally, and then in terms of how I engage with others, Mm -hmm. it does come from this motivation of love and acceptance rather than shame, rather than trying to make my body or someone else's body into something else. And it feels revolutionary. It feels radical to empower and to reclaim and to actively dismantle the internalized fat phobia in myself and the culture around me. Mm -hmm. And I think that that empowerment um, is an act of self-love where that, mm, how do I, how do I say this? I think that that empowerment is for sure an act of self-love, the empowerment to, um, work with your body and work with your wellness in ways that actually serve you in ways that are actually accessible and tailored to your body. And I think that that empowerment is something that we are so often denied. Mm -hmm. And so coming from this space of empowering yourself through recovery and, you know, actively dismantling the shame and the fat phobia and the trauma and the emotional um, issues that are at the core of everything, you know, that empowerment is all connected. And it certainly has been for me in my work. Mm. Wow. Thank you. I'm so glad that you were able to get the help that you needed and deserved and um, that you made a full recovery. And in the process, it sounds like um, because you've had that lived experience, you've, you've just got so many gifts to offer the people you work with now so that's just that's thank you amazing thank you for sharing that um thank you and I'm so grateful that you have this resource out here for other people like us who have like come to this recovery space um through a lot of hard work and you know want to help empower others to along those similar paths Oh, thank you. That's, that is so lovely of you to say. Um, yeah, I, I think that a lot of the stuff I put out is, is, and that I learn from my guests is stuff that I wish I'd heard when I was in the midst of my, you know, disordered eating and, and exercise, um, addiction. And yeah, we just, we kind of live and share what we, <laughs> what we learn and, and what we, need or needed at some point I think yeah yeah and I'm so glad that more of those resources are out there because you know when I was younger when I was really really struggling you know the resources that were out there were really toxic it was oh, a lot of you know nice. my spaces and Zanga pages if anyone remembers Zanga oh yeah with I remember like, my you know, <laughs> oh god with you know pictures of emaciated Oh God, folks. And yeah, I mean, now it's, it's amazing to know that it is possible to get from that low and that eating disorder of a, of a space to this space of like true love and radical empowerment in my body and my relationship with food and my relationship with myself, even as a person beyond my body and beyond a physical level. Um, I am so grateful to know and experience every day that that is possible for me and that it's also possible for others and you know especially when I interface with different um trends in the wellness sphere that are so disempowering and that are so shaming Mm -hmm. the part of me that worked so hard to recover from eating disorders is definitely standing up and being like "Uh uh-uh this is not what I'm here for. And I hope it's not what you're here for either. I love that. I love that your lived experience can provide a bit of fire, dare I say. Yeah. And I know it does for me. <laughs> and that really helps me to keep 
going with this work, which I love, but which also can be exhausting and um, oh, yeah. hard and demand a lot of resources and a lot of training and a lot of my money goes, you know, anything I earn from this often just goes, goes straight back into education and, and more yeah. learning. So yeah, that, that lived experience and that what we have been through, I think, um, yeah, it, it's, it's very helpful and valuable for others. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, and thank God for that fire that our lived experience mm. provides us. Cause then you can just say, you know what, like I'll be triple God damned if I let someone sell back to me the shame that I consumed for years and years and years about, you know, like food and body and exercise and weight, like that is not happening. Totally. And it kind of gives you this 2020 vision regarding, you know, your bullshit meter is, is very sensitive. <laughs> you can just like straight away, that's <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> Don't put that on me. Don't put that on yeah. my friends. <laughs> just take your orthorexic shit and go home, please. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, I promise Katya. So this is my, my last question. I know like I'm really pushing totally it with you, but um, you are an astrologer. So obviously you're into astrology, but I also recently figured out that you're into tarot as well from looking at your social media, which I, I just love so much. Um, yeah. I've been dabbling with tarot for years, but only this year have I started diving more deeply into it. And I think it was, it was a beautiful picture of um, your laptop open, I think on your Instagram account and some tarot card spread doing what looked like a virtual reading for a client. Um, and right mm -hmm. at the end of your caption, you wrote cusps aren't real. <laughs> and I just was wondering uh -huh. <laughs> if you could just talk a little tiny bit about that as someone who's always, I've always been told I was, you know, I was born on the cusp between Libra and Scorpio. So you're a bit of both, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just super curious about that. Yeah. So cusps are like one of the most fascinating pieces of fake news in astrology. <laughs> um, definitely like the most widespread myth in astrology, I think. Um, yeah. So the reason why people think that cusps are real is because, you know, if you are born, you know, near the start of another sign, mm. typically you will, or near the end of another sign, typically you will have, um, certain placements, often prominent placements in that sign. And those are a big part of you. Um, you know, your sun may be fully in Libra, but your Mercury may be in Scorpio and like that. <laughs> It is. <laughs> really shapes some things. No way. <laughs> you just called it. That's me. <laughs> ah, I knew it. That's um, yeah. And that's, you know, that is so significant. And, you know, I think it was Chani Nicholas um, who said that every single degree of every single sign in the Zodiac is significant. So even if you are the last degree or the first degree in the sign of Libra, you are still fully Libra that's still, you know, that degree is still really potently, meaningfully Libra um, in terms of your sun sign. But obviously your sun sign is not everything. That's only one piece of the picture. So when you take into account all the other different pieces of the picture, you're able to see and make sense of why you identified with, you know, those different characteristics. And I know that, you know, when I was a kid, I was like, well, I don't really identify with Aquarius. I'm a Pisces cusp, so I identify with Pisces. <laughs> and then growing, growing up and becoming an astrologer, it's like, oh shit, baby Katya, you're a Pisces moon. <laughs> and children are more evocative of their moon sign than their sun sign, typically. So yeah, no wonder when I was a kid, I identified as a Pisces, because I was a Pisces moon. And now that I'm a grown-ass adult, my four Aquarius placements, including my sun sign, are shining through like no tomorrow. Um, so yeah, just getting to know the full picture, um, you get a, a sense of like why things are that way. Wow. Oh my gosh. That makes so much sense. <laughs> oh my Isn't gosh. Thank you for explaining that to me. Yeah, no you're problem. right. Um, yeah, I always thought, gosh, I am a bit Scorpio. Maybe that's because I'm on the cast. That's why. But 
I've got a bunch of other planets in Scorpio. So maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah. And maybe, I mean, you're, I think your Pluto is probably also in Scorpio. How and that might be. How did you know that? Stop it. Well, I, <laughs> well that's an easy one. Oh that one is very easy because what? there's a certain, there's like a swath of nine years where we all have Pluto and Scorpio because it takes so oh. long to orbit. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So that's like a generational thing. That was not right. impressive, okay. but I'm just I like, didn't know your Mercury was there. <laughs> um, but you know, Pluto might be aspecting, it might have some significant aspects going on with other placements for you that might kind of bring that out a little bit more. Um, so yeah, there's a whole lot of reasons that could be um supporting why you identify with different scorpio traits so much mm, yeah definitely yeah lots of nuance there but oh you have gosh. such libra energy too like you know <laughs> you have such libra sun energy and i think that makes you especially um good at doing the work that you do oh that makes me happy for some reason katia thank you <laughs> Thank you. No for problem. Yeah. Wow. I, I'm so impressed. I think I need to get a reading with you. Anyway, um, this has definitely gone over an hour. So <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up, Katya. Maybe um, just in finishing, could you let listeners know um, if, if there's anything else that you want to let folks know about and where people can find you? For sure. Yeah. So the podcast that I have running now um, is called Kumbaya Confessional, and it's kind of an expose into a lot of these things like what we're talking about um, in the so woo sphere. From... So <laughs> Thank you. I'm very proud of it. Um, and then my other podcast, which I am on a break from right now as I'm hosting Kumbaya Confessional is called Queer Wellness. That is also, um, you know, just up there. You can find both of them on Spotify, iTunes, whatever um, platform you like. Um, and then my website is katiaweissanderson.com. My Instagram is at K-A-T-A-R-I-N-A-A-N-Y-A, which is probably not the best Instagram handle, but it's my first and middle name. Um, maybe in another life, I'll choose one that's easier to spell, but <laughs> that's where to find me. And, you know, anyone who wants an astrology reading or anything like that can just hit up any of those places. Amazing. Thank you so, so much, Katya. I feel so much better after <laughs> ringing some of that dirty laundry out with you especially around the mlm stuff so yeah oh, thank you yeah. thank you for sharing your wisdom in such a, a gentle but really brave and open way the bravery that comes through in your podcast it just it, i find it very inspiring um and thank yeah. you so much casey oh my absolute pleasure it's an honor to be here such an honor yeah and i look forward to sharing your work with my Aww. the folks in my spheres as well oh you rock thank you so much thank you for being here and for straddling the tricky edges of yoga land and diet culture with me i hope this podcast encourages you to compassionately and continuously question the ways that contemporary yoga is unfolding and interacting with other big forces in the world to develop a discerning mind and open heart and to skillfully dodge the diet BS that often comes along with studio culture. Like you, I'm eager to keep learning and sharing and I put all relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, online nutrition counselling services and lots more at funkyforest.com.au. While you're there, make sure to download my free ebook, A Modern Yogi's BS Free Guide to Wellbeing. It's a lighthearted, easy read with my top six tips on dodging diet culture crap in the yoga world, whilst creating sustainable and balanced health from the inside out. If you love the podcast, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash non-dietyogi. There are some pretty rad rewards there, such as exclusive content, discount codes, giveaways, and the ability to chat with me. As more episodes roll out, I'll be adding even more fun bonuses, such as my non-diet yogi cookbook and mini courses. 
And you can access most of the goodies at the lowest level, which is just $2 US a month or around $2.90 Australian dollars. Like most mummers, I'm ridiculously busy parenting, working, studying, and all the rest. I've recorded a bunch of episodes, and some of these have required five separate takes just to get a whole episode done, as I need to wake up before my little ones to do it, and they get up very early. So I'm crossing my fingers that the Patreon will give me the financial capacity to keep doing this. Another way to support is to head over to iTunes and subscribe and review the podcast. That would be so awesome. Thank you. The in and outro song is Evening Glow by John Anderson. Thank you so much for being here. Until next time. Mm